Welcome to the church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday experience. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with him, connects you in your daily experience as we advance his kingdom. As this word encourages you, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment on all platforms. Welcome to all of our guests and our first time visitors. We also want to say welcome to our online. Um, if you're our family online, we want to say God bless you. We are glad you joined us here this morning. My name is Pastor Michael. I am one of the Connect pastors here at the church where our vision is to build a church for God. Around the presence of God. Can you say amen? If you'd like my notes, you can text TC to 77411 that's tc notes to 77411 and you'll be able to get my notes for today would you all stand it is our custom here at the house that we stand for god's word how many of you stand for god's word if you have your bibles turn with me to the book of exodus exodus 1 and we're going to start right there. Ex excuse me, Exodus 17, verse 1. We'll start right there. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's good to be in the house. So y'all better get a little bit louder because I get a little bit louder. The Holy Spirit gets a little bit louder. Can you say amen? Yeah. Exodus 17, 1 through 3. And at the Lord's command... The whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin. This was a geographical place. Sin was not the English word of sin. It was a geographical place of Mount Sinai. And he said, move, they moved from place to place. And eventually they camped at Raphidim. But there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained against Moses Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Come on. He said, shut up. <laughs> Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst dear heavenly father god we come before you we step out of the way holy spirit this is your place this is your room this is your house god we get out of the way and i ask that you just bring your word the way you want it today god this is about you this is about your spirit in this place and we all said amen you may be seated i was going to bring a message today called the apple of your eye and God changed the name of my message and it is going to be stay thirsty my friend Dos Equis took over this saying a long time ago and you all know the gentleman that stands there you all know about thirsty Thursdays if you've been in the world at any given time thirsty Thursday was stay thirsty my friend and you would drink a beer but this morning, my message is Kyle, stay thirsty, my friend. And the ushers are passing out some water. I want you to take this water. This isn't for you to drink right now, but I want every person to grab a bottle of water. If you can drink out of this bottle, you need to have this with you. I don't care if you're three years old or you're 85 years old or 100 years old. You need this bottle today. But don't open it and don't drink it yet. In Exodus 17, 3, he said, but tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. And take your staff, the one you use to strike the water on the Nile. 
and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. And he said, I will stand before you on that rock of Mount Sinai. And I want you to strike the rock and the water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he had been told and water gushed out as the elders looked on. The Bible says that Moses named this place Masa, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord here with us or not? All of us have things in our life that we go through. We have trials and we have stuff. I'll say stuff. We have stuff that we go through. We've been known to complain about the little things in our lives. See, some people have things that are going on in their life and they don't know how to control it. But there are some problems in our lives that we can control by just changing and shifting a little bit in our life. We can actually solve some of the problems that we go through just rearranging the priorities that are in our own lives. See, some of these things we can even solve by having conversation with great people and people of God. But there's always a but. But there's some things that can only be answered by prayer. See, prayer is this thing. And you all have heard, we need you to pray. We want you to pray. You need to pray. How many of you have a good prayer life? That's all right. Only one person I said, mm-hmm. If you don't have a good prayer life, that's where it starts. See, he said, but there's prayer. What it does is prayer, it, it, it tames your thoughts and it tames your emotion. See, sometimes we are driven by our own thoughts and we're driven by our own emotion, but we're not driven by what we hear in our prayers. At times, God wants us just to stop and slow down and prayers. It quiets our thoughts and it quiets our emotions and it prepares us for the Holy Spirit to speak in our lives. This said, but tormented by thirst. How many's ever been tormented by thirst? Come on, everyone should be raising your hand. You live in Arizona. It's been 119 degrees outside. I'm sure somebody in this room has been tormented by thirst. See, the dictionary defines water as a clear liquid substance. It has no color and it has no taste and it has no smell. But anyone that's been around in the state or the state of Arizona, they know that water is essential so you don't dehydrate. See, it falls from the heavens in the clouds and it creates rains and it forms streams and rivers and lakes and oceans. See, water is used for drinking, washing our clothes, just doing all the things of life. Water is used for many different things. But here's a few examples of how water works in your physical body. See, it regulates your temperature. And it moistens the tissue that's in your eyes and in your nose and in your mouth. See, it protects your organs, the body organs and the tissue. So it's healthy. It carries nutrients and oxygen to the cells. It lubricates the joints. Anyone have sore joints? Woo. Come on. Any of us that have arthritis, like I've had 14 knee surgeries. I got a fake knee on the right knee and two screws in the left knee. Thank you, Jesus, but I can still walk. Come on. See, it lubricates the joints so they can move, so they're not stiff. See, it lessens the burdens of the kidneys and the liver, and it flushes out all the waste in product. And it dissolves the minerals and the nutrients to make them accessible to the vital parts of your body. But by pr these little couple practices, these are some of the tips that will help you in your daily body. You say, what does this have to do with church? Just watch. See, you start your morning off by drinking a glass of water as soon as you wake up. Studies say that if you do that, even before you drink your coffee, come on, somebody. That's hard. I work for Starbucks. Come on. I know what it's like to drink some coffee. 
I got to get up, and that coffee's got to be running, but it says just drink some water before you do anything. Carry a water bottle wherever you go. How many of you carry a water bottle everywhere? Can I see that hydro? Where's that at? I carry this thing everywhere. I was getting a haircut the other day. And I had it and I forgot. The lady at the haircutting place sends me a picture of a water bottle and said, you forget something? Whew. It was 119. I had to turn around and go back real quick because I needed my hydration bottle. See, I set goals every day on how much water I can drink. And you should too. The statistic says that you should actually take about half of your body weight. If you weigh 200 pounds, you should drink 100 ounces of water. It's that simple. That's how much water you need to intake. And then it cuts out the sugary beverages to avoid empty calories. There's a clip I want you to watch real quick. It's clean. It's cold. And that's what I call high quality a tool. Oh! See, we laugh at water jokes, right? But it wasn't too long ago in my life that there was a time that I thought water was only good for making ice cubes for my crown and Sprite. I hated water. I hated it. I even told people that people drown in water, but they don't drown in Sprite. That was my motto. Anyone that knew me knew that's what I said. I hated water. I didn't drink it. I didn't like it. And as we go through life, it's all right. You can laugh. You can laugh in church. Can someone say amen? amen. I thought when I came to this church, it was a cool church. Pastor Sonny, I've known him for a long time. And he had this message in this series back when we came it was the year of the stretch elder c didn't know that this was in my message and he told all the men on marco hey go watch this back from when we started the year of the stretch and i watched it it was good and i thought man it stretches in my life see at that point in my life i wasn't where i really should have been and things started to stretch in my life. I started changing where I was at. I started changing the people around me. I started changing the things that were in my life. I changed what I started consuming and the things that started going out. Because he was stretching me for a certain period of my life. And I didn't understand it. But he said, around you, you have to start shifting some things. See, when you shift you got to put some shift into your life. I'm just going to be real. You got to put shift into your life. Things have to move and begin to change. Otherwise, you're going to forget the F in it, and it's just going to be that. You'll hear that in a minute, and you'll read that. But you got to keep the F in it because that's a shift in your life to get you out of the stuff you're doing. Can I be real this morning? The next year we did a really cute message. It was called the year of the pace setter. And we started to stretch and stretching in the pace setter. You got to stretch before you run. Do I have any runners in the house? Anyone that likes to run? Anyone ever run and forget to stretch before you run? What happens? You cramp up, right? You start doing this. Your life starts getting a little funky for a while because you're limping around. You can't walk straight. You pull a muscle, you pull a hammy, you get cramps in the middle of the night because you didn't stretch the way you were supposed to. And then as the year of the pace setter came, I began to grow just a little bit more. And I said, God, I don't know what this is around me, but things begin to happen. And there was tragedy that happened in our family's life. I lost my little brother in that year of the pace setter. Things begin to be hard and difficult, but God was preparing me for a certain time. And then pastor told us this year that we were going to hunger and thirst. And I thought, oh, that's cool. We're going to hunger and thirst. 
And we kicked off the year with a bunch of fasting. And he told all of our pastoral care, guess what? We're not just going to fast 21 days in January. Guess what? We're going to fast every month. And I thought, oh my God, I ain't never fasted so much in my life until I came to this church. I hadn't. I like food. I did. I got up to 245 pounds. I liked food. My favorite place to eat is where? Fogo de Chao. And anyone that knows about that, that's an all you can eat Brazilian steakhouse. Come on now. This ain't even in my message. This is extra. You think I'm joking. Come on now. It's Fogo de Chao. I got one of their little cards in my Bible. I forgot it was there till just now. One side says, yes, please bring me more. The other side says, no, stop. You need to slow down. You can ask anyone that's ever been to Fogo with me. They never see the red ever because I like food because I was hungry. But pastor said, you're going to put aside some food this year. And I thought, God, why are you having us fast so much? Why? And he said, because I want you hungry. And I said, but God, you said it's hunger and thirst. And I said, I don't get this. And he said, but you will. He said, hold on. I'm not done. And I didn't get this thing. I didn't understand it. See, do we really have spiritual thirst? What does it mean to have spiritual thirst? See, there's some things that being truly thirsty, being truly thirsty for Christ, it will change who you are. And here's a few of the examples. If you'll put them up, it regulates the body temperature. See, you stop having a temper with everyone that's around you. You can read them. Uh, these are my notes. It's straight out of my note. Just like that. Not even in church. Come on. Some people have a temper and until they get a little bit of Jesus inside of them, they allow the Holy spirit to change their temperature. They'll still pop off. They wouldn't let me in the service early and I need to be in cause I didn't have a lanyard. They wouldn't let me do this or they wouldn't let me do that. Someone looked at me the wrong way, whatever it is. It also moistens the tissue, tissue in your eyes, nose and mouth. See, you stop looking at the things you shouldn't. You stop smelling like the old things that were there on you before. You stop talking about others and start speaking and stop speaking death and start speaking life into you. It says it protects the body organs and tissue. See, he guards your heart. He stops the fiery darts from damaging the tissue in your body. This is my favorite. He carries nutrients and oxygen to the cell. See, he provides life and breath that's in you. It doesn't stop. You say, what does the water do? This is what water does. See, it's not the same as what it used to be. It's not the same as what it used to be. It lubricates the joints and it takes the pain and the aches out from the, what's inside of you. See, there's some church people that have aches in them. There's some of you sitting here today because God showed me who you are. I know your face. I know what it is. You didn't come here by chance. God said, you have something inside of you that's hurting. You have something, some achy joints inside your body. And you're not sure what it is. And it wakes you up at night. Doesn't let you sleep. It stops you from doing the things that he's made you to do. We'll come back to that. It lessens the burdens on the kidneys and the liver and it flushes the waste out. See, as water makes up the burdens that slowed the critical parts of you working, it flushes all the crap, and I said crap, out from you. 
inside your heart, it washes it all away. It dissolves minerals and nutrients to make them accessible to your body. See, his water, it takes the things that he wants in your life. Not what you want, but it takes the things that he wants in your life. And it wants you to grow and it liquefies so they can be captured throughout your entire body and in your soul and in your mind and in your spirit and in your tongue and in your ears and in your eyes. See, his water liquefies all the blessings that he wants for you and it just disperses into your life. But so many times we don't take a drink. You say, Pastor Michael, (laughs) I'm good. I got a little bit. I got some. I feel good. How many of you feel good this morning? I did too until about two weeks ago. I would tell you if you feel good, you're not thirsty. If you feel good, and I'm going to say this again, I would have much rather preached the apple of your eye. It was a pretty message. Maybe someday, but it wasn't for today. Do you get tormented by thirst and do you complain that you don't get the water fast enough see there's some things that by by practicing these tips God's going to help you start your morning off by drinking a glass of the Holy Spirit as soon as you wake up before your coffee carry the Holy Spirit in Jesus wherever you go set the goals for yourself how much am I going to take in today of for my body and build the goals so they go more and more and more cut out anything that's not of him to avoid the emptiness inside of you see as you ask you think you have all the things of God you say I got work I can't think about God all the time How many of you have the word that our pastor hates? Busy lives. How many have busy lives? It's all right. You can raise your hand. How many of you have a lot of stuff going on all the time? You find it difficult to slow down and to find time. Pretty soon you realize it's a day after another day after another day. And man, I ain't opened my Bible. I didn't open this thing. That's my life source. We got football games. We got soccer games. We got practice. We got gymnastics. We got all the stuff in our lives. Isaiah 58 and 11, it says, the Lord will guide you continually. I'm going to stop right there. Do you hear that? He's going to guide you continually. That means nonstop. It doesn't have hesitation. It doesn't have pause. See, that's the thing about God. God doesn't pause in the middle of your life. He doesn't say it's going to stop just because you're all wrapped up in all the other affairs and the things that you're doing. God said, I am going to still continuously be with you. I give you the water. And he said, the Lord will guide you continually and give you water when you're dry and restore your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. So, the people complained against Moses. And God said, tell Moses. God said, Moses, I want you to grab that rod. I want you to grab your staff. I want you to grab the staff that you smacked the Nile River. That's important. I don't think some people catch what the significance of that was. Why did he tell him to grab that staff? Why did he tell him to get that? Because it's been proven that when he struck it, there was power. And he said, I'm going to stand on that rock before you. And he said, I want you to strike the rock and water is going to come forth. See, there's some of you today, if I was just to smack this rock and water would come forth, you'd be like the elders back in that time that just stood and just watched. You wouldn't know what to say. They were amazed. They didn't even go forward to it. They just stood and they watched. See, they could have ran to the rock where the water was, but they just stood there and they froze in being, did God just do that? With the same rod that had already parted the waters. 
He just said, and if I smack it and water flies out, what are you going to do? He smacked the rock and water came forth. How stupid does that look? God's going to tell you to do stupid things sometimes. He's going to tell you to do things. These people that were complaining, they were ready to stone Moses. They were ready to kill him. And he said, pick up a stick and hit a rock. How many times has God told you to pick up a stick and just strike a rock? You're like, God, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard you tell me to do. Why are you telling me to do this in my life? He said, are you obedient or are you going to do what I told you to do? Or are you going to die of thirst? And he said, he picked up the stick and the water started to gush out and people just stood around. But God said he was going to stand He's going to stand on that rock. I'm taking my time this morning because some of you need to get what this scripture really says. He said, I want you to pick up this staff and I want you to smack the rock that I stand on. Someone's going to get this. But see, God said, I'll stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. See, some of us are smacking rocks that God ain't standing on. See, you're going through the motion. You're doing all the right things, all the right steps. And you're just going. And you just look like a moron sitting there smacking empty rocks with nothing on it. See, the key was not the staff. The key was not the rock. The key was that God said, I'll stand on that rock. See, in life, when we're thirsty, there are things. I said, there are things that are inside of you that you just are walking around smacking rocks, thinking I'm going to get my water from this and I'm going to get my water from this pleasure. And I'm going to get my water from this and I'm going to get my water from that. And you're just smacking empty rocks. And God said, you're hitting all the rocks that I'm not standing on. He said, when are you going to be obedient and hit the rock that I told you to stand on? That I'm in that place. See, we build a church for God around the presence of God. And his presence is right there on that rock. And he said, that living water is going to come when you smack it if I'm standing on it. But you got to wait for me to stand on it. He said, I'm not on it yet. See, Moses could have, while they were complaining, he could have said, God, I'm going to take this. I believe you can do it. I'm going to say this. I'm going to grab this and I'm going to hit the rock and water will come out. He had already seen God do it. He knew he could do it. His face was already there. But God said, wait, it's not time yet. He said, I didn't say yes. And I didn't say no. He said, wait, he didn't know what I was preaching. He said, wait. Wait till I get on that rock and then smack it. And that's when the water will come. After all the things he's done for us. This year. All the things that he's done for you this year. All of the things that are in your life this year. All the things he started doing in 2020. All the things he's done in your entire life. And we still stand in amazement that God could bring water from a rock. See, when you're hungry. When you're hungry, something happens. What happens when you get hungry? Stomach grumbles. You get signs, right? When you did a 21 day fast, who did the 21 day fast in January? Amen. How many has done the fast every month that the pastors have been assigning for you to do? 
Anyone? So when you are fasting, there's a hunger, and your stomach begins to growl. It stinks. It does. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Day three is the worst for me. Because your body, no matter where you're at, I'm in a meeting with people, and all of a sudden you don't get that quiet little growl. I'm talking, it's like, (laughs) right? Like people across the room can hear your stomach growling. And that's what hunger does. But see, the fact is that with food, you can go days without food. You can even go weeks without food. You can even go months without food. Pastor's been on a liquid only 40 day fast. Who wants to jump on that bandwagon and have that fast? I didn't think so. 40 days without food. The devil is a lie. But if he said to do it, would you? See, I didn't understand until the last couple of weeks. And I was sitting up. I was actually up north. I was in Bullhead City. In the Holiday Inn Express. Because I have to travel for work. And I was sitting up there. And the Holy Spirit woke me up. At a little bit after midnight. The Holy Spirit said. I want you to do a fast. And I've taken back my health. I've started doing something different. I've been on a program that doesn't allow me to fast. But the Holy Spirit said, who do you trust in? So I said, okay, God. I didn't even tell my wife. And he said, I want you to do a fast that you've never done before. And it was July 12th going into July 13th, which was a Wednesday night into a Thursday morning. And he said, I want you to fast and I don't want you to drink anything. I said, God, I work for a coffee company. We got to taste the coffees. We got to do all these things. God, it's 119 degrees outside today. It's hot. I'm going to get thirsty. And he said, I want you to know what it is to truly thirst. I said, okay. And he said, I want you to read the book of Esther. So at one o'clock in the morning, half asleep, I read the book of Esther, the whole book. And I had read Esther before. And if you don't know about Esther, I don't have enough time to go through the entire thing, but I want you to go back and read Esther so you understand this. But Mordecai had told Esther that there was a decree that was written on April 17th. The Bible even tells us the day. I think this is amazing. That there was a decree made that the following March, on March 7th, that all the Jews would be killed. And they would have, this would also include Israel and all of God's chosen people would be exterminated from the earth. That's what the decree was. And God's plan to have his son come back to this earth as a Jew in the Jewish lands in Israel was in compromise and could have been just wiped out if this would have been fulfilled. But God told Mordecai, I want you to go to Esther. You need to go tell Esther about this plan. And Mordecai told her, and the law said that in the inner courts, that when anybody went in to see the king in the inner courts that wasn't summoned, they would be doomed to death. It was a death sentence. You would die unless the king hung out his golden scepter. And Esther said in Esther 4 and 16, you can put it up. He said, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa. And fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days and three nights. My maids and I will do the same. 
And then, though it is against the law, and I will go into see the king. And if I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything that Esther had ordered for him. See, there was something about when God told me to fast, and I didn't understand this until after this fast. See, what happened was during that day I was talking just like I am now, and I started getting my lip started sticking to my teeth. Anyone ever have that happen where you're just talking and it's like your mouth gets so dry. My throat began to just throb. It started to close up a little bit and I almost felt like I was going to have an asthma attack or cough and I couldn't even begin to move. It bothered me the entire day as I was working. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do anything and it was just in my throat and my mouth and eventually through the day, the longer the day got, it began to go through my chest and my back and my head started hurting and he said that's what it's like to thirst for me he said do you have that same thirst and I said my god what are you saying and he said I want you to have a place I want you to be so hungry I want you to be so thirsty that no matter what you're doing you think about me you just want a drink of that little bit of water I just need a little bit of that just to quench what's inside of me and God said that's what my water does he said but do you thirst after it see he showed me that people are looking for that water in so many different places they do it through their life. They do it because there's something missing inside. He said, that's not just the people of this world. That's also my church. Are you at a place that you're ready to do difficult things for God? An Esther fast is not anything to mess with. See, the Bible says that the Esther fast was done in cases of emergency, in life-threatening situations. See, some of you are in life-threatening situations today. And God showed me who you are, but it's going to be up to you today what you're going to do. He brought me here today with this message, and he woke me up in the middle of the night to tell you that he wants you to thirst for him. Stop looking for the water in the places that you're looking you're never going to find it. You're hitting rocks that he's not standing on. He said, I need you as my people to look for the rock that I'm standing on. And I need you to thirst for it. I need you to crave it. I need you to desire it more than you ever have. This year has been a year We'll just say it's been a year. On March 12th of this year, I got really sick. And I don't normally get sick, but when I get sick, I got sick. And I told Tammy, I woke up, I didn't go to school or go to school. <laughs> I ain't been to school in a long time. I didn't go to work that day on a Monday. I called out and I was like, I don't call out of work. And I said, but I can't, I can't go to work today. I'm, I'm just, I'm so sick. And I said, I need you to take me to the emergency room. So she took me to the emergency room and she dropped me off. And they began to run all kinds of tests and do all kinds of things. And they did a CT scan of my stomach. And they said, you have gases and air leaking out of your stomach or intestine somewhere. And it's in the line of your belly. And if we don't get it fixed, you can die. That's what they told me. I'm like, okay. So I began to, they took me to St. Joseph's Hospital. And they went and they did an endoscopy on me. If you don't know what that is, it's where they put a scope down your mouth, go into your intestines. They checked. They said there's nothing wrong with your intestines or your stomach. Like there's no leak. There's nothing. We don't understand why the gases are there. And then the doctor, the GI doctor said, you have this thing. And he called it by name, and I don't even know what it is. It's this long somethingology thing on it. And he doesn't even know what to do. He said, I'll be honest, it's a very rare thing. He said, we don't even have a cot or a treatment for it. He said, so we're just going to keep you in the hospital and wait. I said, okay. 
So we prayed, and the church prayed. I thought, I feel better. I'm not sick no more. It's all good. But God said, they told me I had to have surgery at first, and I said, they said, no, you don't have to have surgery. You're good. You can go home. They said, but we want you to follow up in a couple months. I said, okay. So I did a follow-up in June, and they had me do another scan of my stomach. And, of course, I was up north again. I was in Lake Havasu. And I get a phone call from the doctor that says, hey, there's a large mass on your liver. And you need to go see your doctor right away. I said, okay. So I did. I didn't understand it. We called a friend of ours that is a doctor. She's a hematologist, oncologist. If you don't know what that is, that's a cancer doctor. They've been treating my wife for a long time. They treated my mom when she had colon cancer. They were like family to us, great doctor. She called me in the office and, or called me and said, hey, I need you to come in and I want you to do some blood tests today. And you know when the cancer doctor calls you and they say, I want you to come in today, fear starts to set in, right? Things start to get a little desperate. So I went in on July, or I went in and they, on July 5th, she called me and said, I got the results. I need you to come in and do blood work today. I want to see you on Monday in my office. So we come in and the doctor walks in and she looks at us and says, how are you doing? My wife, the bold lady that she is, she said, I don't know. You tell us, doctor, how's he doing? That was a quote. She said, there's not a mass there. there the mass is on his kidney and it's the same one that we did on a scan three years ago. It's been the same. Hasn't changed. It's all the same. You don't have cancer. Don't worry about it. It's all good. She said, but it's on your kidney, so I want you to go see a urologist. I said, all right. So I get a phone call three days later. And they want me to do another CT scan. So I did. I went in for the CT scan. And July 19th, they did the CT scan. And then I get a call on July 30, 21st, which was this Friday. And it's the same oncologist doctors. And they said, they left me a message and Tammy called them back. I was on some calls. And they said, you do have a spot on your liver. We were mistaken. And in June, when you did the scan, it was 2.1 millimeters or centimeters, excuse me, 2.1 centimeters. They said three weeks later, it's 3.1 centimeters and the density has changed. That was Friday. And Tammy looks at me and she said, do you need to rewrite your message? I said, no. Because see, I made a statement last year while I was preaching that I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid of cancer. I'm not afraid of sickness. I'm not afraid of anything. Why I'm not afraid is because I know where I stand and I know who stands on my rock. See, I know what rock I'm hitting and I didn't understand why I need to be thirsty until Friday. I thought my message was going to be one way, but I said, I'm not afraid to die. And I'll stand here today on TV, on YouTube. You can go back to the other messages. And devil, I wanted to be very clear. Go back to hell where you belong. You don't belong in my life. You can't be attached to my life. And I'm still not afraid. See, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, I do not have a spirit of fear. 
I am not afraid of disease. I am not timid, it says. If you are timid with what's inside of you or what, the, what is eating you, trust me, I could have been sitting there and I could have changed my message. Because the enemy said, how are you going to stand up there and talk about I, you've already been healed where now you got something else going on? I said, that's just another chapter of my testimony. See, there is something. I didn't even tell elder or them about this this week. I told our pastors and I told my immediate family and that's it. See, there was something and the Holy Spirit woke me up this morning early again. Man, doesn't he talk to you in the middle of the night? And he said, there's a reason why the doctors couldn't tell you what that was in your stomach. He said, it's not going to be like the lost puppy that you find that you put a name on it. Because when you put a name on it, it own, you own it now. So no things can attach itself to me. See, it was prophesied, and I didn't even tell this. It's not even my message, but I'm going to tell you anyway. See, I was prophesied over in January. My former pastors in California, Bishop Filkey, I love you, Bishop Filkey, and his wife, Jordana, she wrote down in her prayer journal in January. She sent me a screenshot of it two weeks ago, and she doesn't even know about this. And it said you're going to walk through some things, but those things can attach to you. They're going to fall off of you. So don't give it a name and don't let it attach itself to you. And time and time again, as Christians, we sit here and we let things attach to our lives. We let people attach to our lives. We let situations attach to our lives. We let sickness attach to our lives. We let discomfort attach to our lives. We let divorce attach to our lives. We let fornication attach to our lives. We let alcoholism attach to our lives. We let, let uh, all of these things attach to our lives. And God said, don't let it attach. Psalms 9 and 10, it says, for those who know your name, they trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. See, the thirst part is what we haven't got into this year. We've talked a lot about hunger. A lot. But we haven't talked a lot about thirst. Because thirst is a lot harder than hunger. It's the next level. See, there's a hunger that you can live without food, like I said, for months. You can't live but days without water. You can't. That's why the Esther fast is so valuable. It says you can only do it for three days. Don't do it any longer. It's not even wise. Don't do it. It's only for three days. You say, oh, I'm stronger than that. I'm going to try to do it. Don't do it. Don't be ignorant. Don't be striking rocks that God ain't calling you to strike. He said, I've given you hope if you search for me. He said, those who know your name and trust in you, for you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. But you got to search for him. See, we come, searching for God is not coming to the church. I'm just going to tell you, it's not. This is just like the cherry on top. This is not hungering and thirsting for God to come in, sing our songs, do our worship, do our praise, do all our things, and then go home. That's not hunger and thirsting. Jeremiah 17 and 7 says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. So this morning, I'm going to talk about a fast this week. See, there's some of you inside. You're going to go through some hard things, some difficult things. There's something in front of you down the road that you're about to go. And whatever it is, God said, 
you have to thirst for me before I can get you through it. It's not enough to just hunger. It's not enough. You have to thirst for me. Are you at a place that you desire God so much that every time you move, your throat is dry? You can't hardly talk. You're distracted. You get headaches. You're all of these things. Your body is just, ugh. And God said, I need you to beat that down. Bring yourself into submission. And he's going to call you to a fast this week. And I'm going to tell you what the fast is, but it's up to you on the length of time. See, God wants you to thirst. So he wants you to fast sometime this week. You pick the day. It doesn't matter. You pick the time. It doesn't matter. If you work outside, I would suggest not fasting during that time that you're working outside. It's not wise. You're striking rocks that God ain't standing on. Maybe your fast starts at 5 p.m. when you get home in the cool air conditioned house and it goes till 6 o'clock in the morning the next day. I don't know. The time is up to you. But God said, I want you to fast from any liquids this week because it's going to prepare you for something. And when you break that fast, that bottle of water that you were given, I want you to drink it. And why I want you to drink it is I prayed over every bottle before you got them. And your miracle is going to come at the end of that fast. There are some things that are falling off of people that's not yours. You're grabbing onto things and holding tight to things that God doesn't want you to attach. You have relationships that God wants you to cut and sever and tie, but you're still not strong enough to do it. There are things in your life that God wants to move you to a next generation, to a next level, but you're not ready yet. And he said, you will be this week if you'll thirst for me. Do you really want to thirst? Or do we just have it as a cute shirt that says hunger and thirst? So the water bottle, I want you to take it with you. And this week, when you end your fast, I want you to open it and I want you to begin to praise. I want you to thank him for the promise that he gave you. I don't know if you heard that. The promise that he gave you. See, I serve a God that doesn't lie. The Bible says the devil is the father of all lies, right? We don't serve a God that lies. He stands by his word and his word says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us if we seek him out. He will not abandon you if you seek him. So that's our fast. Say, why do you have an apple? How many likes apples? Who loves apples? I want one of you that love an apple to come up here. I didn't tell you. If you love an apple, I want you to come up here. Come on up. Did you know that there are 7,500 different types of apples? 7,500. There are 2,500 apples that are manufactured in the U.S. Bet you didn't know that, did you? There's a lot of apples. It's called a red delicious apple. I picked that myself. I looked at it. The apple looks good, doesn't it? But what if I told you there was a worm inside of it? Probably is. <laughs> Thank you. See, God said, there's some of you that are just like this apple here today. You look good, but there's something inside eating you up. There's a worm inside of you that's killing you. And you won't get it out. There's something that's stopping you 
from doing all that God wants you to do. It could be pride. It could be emotion. It could be bitterness, hatred. But inside that apple, God said, you're the apple of my eye. That was my message. That would have been a whole lot easier to preach. But he said, there's something inside of you. And this morning, if that's you, I don't want you to wait as the musicians come. I want you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, See, in Jonah 4 and 7, it says, but God also arranged a worm the next morning at dawn, and the worm ate through the stem of the plant, so they withered away. This morning, God doesn't want you to wither away. And you're dangerously in a place. It's life or death. God showed me it's life or death. Because there's things that you're going through that will change who you are and how you walk, depending on how you respond. God said, I'm placing everything in your court. I'll do it like I said I'd do it, but you got to thirst. It won't be your way. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We pray that you were blessed and stretched by today's word. Maybe you need a prayer or have a question for us here at the church. Make sure to fill out our contact form on our website at thechurchphx.com and stay connected with us on our Instagram and Facebook at The Church PHX. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday at our 10 a.m. Sunday experience, either in person or online. And remember, we are the church, building a church for God around the presence of God.